Uh, hello. Uh, we'll talk now about Lina Bobardi, a very important uh, uh, Italian architect who worked and lived in uh, in Brazil. Uh, and uh, uh, I like very, very much these words, an architecture of perfect imperfection, that someone used uh, this Martin Filler about her and about her work. Uh, an architecture of perfect imperfection. I think we will all do better if we welcome this uh, perfect imperfection, which applies <clears throat> very well to uh, to the work of Lina Bobardi. So Lina Bobardi, born uh, Achillina Bo, uh, was an Italian-born Brazilian modernist uh, architect. As you can see, born on the December 5th, and that's the reason we talk about her today, because today is December 5th, but 2023. So she was a prolific architect and designer. She devoted her working life, most of it spent in Brazil, to promoting the social and cultural potential of architecture and design. While she studied under radical Italian architects, she quickly became intrigued with Brazilian vernacular design and how it could influence a modern Brazilian architecture. During her lifetime, it was difficult to be accepted among the local Brazilian architects because she was both a so-called foreigner and a woman. Uh, she is recognized for her unique, uh, the unique style of the, of the many architectural illustrations she created over her lifetime, along with her tendency to leave poignant notes to, to herself. She is also known for her furniture and jewelry designs. The popularity of her works has increased since 2008, when a 1993 catalog of her works was republished. A number of her product designs are being revived, an exhibition such as her 1968 exhibition of glass and concrete easels have been uh, recreated. And uh, here is an example of such, uh, such an uh, exhibition, Lina Bobardi. Radical pedagogies, Lina Bobardi's theory of an immediate life architecture. I love these words, immediate life architecture. This is about the very essence of architecture. It has to be nourished by life and it has to address life and, and the relationship between life and architecture goes well beyond, you know, theorizing excessively or using the the ethereal and pretentious world of concepts and so on, you have to start from life. And if it is immediate, all for the better. So um, Lina Bobardi, in her modesty, uh, left a very important uh, uh, trace in the sand of architecture. Arch Daily, uh, anyway, this uh, text that I re reproduce here, since that Arch Daily is continuing uh, our partnership with Radical Pedagogies, an ongoing multi-year collaborative research project led by Beatrice Colomina with a team of PhD students of the School of Architecture at Princeton University in the United States, presenting a series of paradigmatic cases in ar architectural education. In this four example, fourth example of Radical Pedagogies in Latin America, Vanessa Grossman uh, presents Lina Bobardi's application for a chair. Uh, she applied, like many of us uh, have to do, for a job. Uh, her application for a chair at the Faculty of Architecture and Urban Studies at the University of Sao Paulo. Although the application was rejected, as often happens, the case, or as often is the case with the uh, uh, with the important creators, unfortunately, it's like the sarcasm of fate. So although the application was rejected by the faculty commission, the submitted essay still is a singular source of new ideas for architectural education. And uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit uh, uh, about, about this. This was the cover of, 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 of the book published with her ideas, uh, contributions to, anyway, the theory of architecture, but she was a doer and she built. And here she is in her own home, uh, a modernist statement uh, in Brazil, uh, the theory of an immediate life architecture. These are her own words. And here she is 
and I love this picture of her, uh, a serious, sensitive person, uh, maybe a dreamer, but also a, do a doer who knew how to build, uh, uh, you know, some uh, very enticing and inciting uh, uh, buildings. The glass house from 1951, and you saw a picture already of her, uh, Bobardi's, uh, Lina Bobardi's residence. She lived with her own husband there. This is the building. I'm okay, maybe it's not uh, striking any longer after seeing so many modern modernist buildings. But at that time, 1951, Brazil uh, was still, uh, you know, a, a building, uh, if not shocking, but impressive with, with its, uh, its, uh, its novelty. Uh, and simplicity at the same time. And also what is remarkable here is that she places a huge a giant tree inside the, it's actually the, the soul of the, of the building. It's inside the building. Uh, sorry, this is another, uh, another, another building and we are going to see it. So this is the house that she built in 1951. Uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> and in in uh, in, uh, in Brazil, the relationship with the outside is more, uh, uh, you know, more organic, so to speak, because of the climate. Uh, it's a warm climate, so you can see you enter from the from the outside directly into into the inside without a vestibule. Here she is, in from the back, contemplating the beauty of nature. And that's how the building, the interior, the living room looks like. It's a foundation, perhaps, with a sitting, uh, you know, at least the, the armchair is by Charles Sims. Um, yeah. We go quickly because we have to talk about three architects today, all related to the, to the 5th of December. And today, as I said, it is the 5th of December. So we are just contemplating her own house after she departed temporarily from this earth. I say temporarily because who knows? Maybe she returns in some form. Maybe as an architect again. The beautiful tree that uh, um, refuses to be marginalized, so it's right right in the center of the courtyard, and the and the house is uh, uh, organized uh, respecting this this beautiful tree. This sorry, uh, the resolution of the of the plans is not great. Uh, I apologize, but uh, you can still see it's it's not the smallest house on earth. It's not the largest either. And yes, it became a museum, just as a so-called uh, important person becomes a statue. The house of an important person becomes a museum. Uh, yes, magnificent, magnificent nature and magnificent tree. Uh, you see the lover of books. At the same time, sometimes, some, somehow, you know, books are uh, hard to avoid. Uh, you love beauty, you love knowledge, you love nature, you love books. Bobardi Studio in Sao Paulo in 1986. Now, this is another house she built for herself 35 years later. So after 35 years, she built this, a very different house, a smaller house, a more modest house, but a brilliant architecture, in my opinion. If we talk today about uh, primitive futures, here is a possible uh, glimpse at, at, at something that might belong to what we might call a primitive future. Lina Bobardi, again, surrounded by nature, and here she is uh, in a chair that she designed and back to the second home that she built for herself. Um, it's possible that by that time her husband died. So a brilliant architect uh, living and working in, in, in modest uh, circumstances uh, much more modest than many so-called, uh, uh, you know, uh, creative architects today who are far from being as important as she was. 
But we see that even uh, 1986, no? in 1986, when, well, I don't know actually when this picture was taken, but we see her staring at the computer. So, uh, you know, the house might be, you know, might look uh, primitive and primal, but uh, its majesty, the computer is already there. Bravo to her. And I, I, I love the, the warmth of the interior and the simplicity, you know, and, uh, and it's, you can tell it's, it's, it's the house of a, of a sensitive person, a uh, person who understood that to practice architecture is not a business and should not be uh, considered as such. Uh, it's a creative activity. And here she is in another chair she designed uh, and another chair she designed. Uh, she benefited from the the abundance of wood in um, you know massive wood solid wood in brazil this is not ikea furniture this is uh, you know the real thing you know the the wood sprain is is wood and probably a very high quality wood a very strong and maybe lightweight maybe i don't know another chair by her architects love to design chairs so she was no exception but she designed other things as well. I always say this to young architects and students, design a chair. If you don't have a client, if you don't have a commission, you do have a pencil and a piece of paper or a laptop or something, design a chair. It's very rewarding. It's therapeutic, actually. And become some kind of a self-portrait, a chair. Um, on the other hand, the chair is difficult. It's difficult to design. And Miss Van der Rohe said at one moment that uh, at one point that uh, a chair could be more, it's more difficult to design than a, than a skyscraper. And in a way, it's true. Now, a sugar mill converted to a craft museum in Bahia. Um, here, she worked with an existing context. Um, what is amazing here is that stair that she designed and built because it animates the whole space, the whole room, like a sculpture, but it's actually a stair. And you see it has a certain monumentality because you see the, the, you know, the, the human uh, proportion. Uh, uh, the, the, the stair is exquisite. It's, 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 it's uh, structural, it's rigid, and it's also um, uh, aerial somehow, you know, it's, it's like a sculpture inserted between those four poles that, that also has the function of bringing you from downstairs, upstairs, and vice versa. Very fine stair, isn't it? And you see how it is made. Solid wood, of course. It goes without saying. Great. You know, stairs usually um, are, uh, you know, uh, chances for uh, expressing uh, architecturalness. And in this case as well. It's a creation. It's musical. And you see it in plan, you know, it's, it's all there is. You don't need a lot, but you can deal with, with you can do a simple means a lot. This is what a good architect does. You invent things, you know, you create something. This stair does the same job as other countless stairs, but it's still unique. It doesn't copy other stairs. It's, it's by itself a creation, the creation of Lina Bobardi. And of course, wood never lets you down. If you have affection for wood, wood returns the paper, returns the affection. Here she is with a, with a kitten. Now, this house from 1958 to 1964, uh, I love this house. It's, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, so-called primitivism. is actually uh, a romantic uh, feature and... Uh, 
it's, 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 it's a splendid example showing that you can do a lot with very little. Uh, you know, uh, an existing building where she added the swimming pool and, the, the, you know, the veranda and you see the abundance of nature. Particularly for our time, I think uh, the examples of this kind of architecture are important because they they underline uh, the, the the very necessary relationship between the building and the garden or 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 the forest or nature or trees or bushes or grass. We cannot afford any longer to neglect uh, nature. Here she is on the building site. Now Teatro Officina, a beautiful example of a kind of an anti theater because it is not, you know, the, the typical uh, pretentious uh, Western European theater or opera building with two lions left and right and with a majestic stair that leads to the entrance. It's the very opposite. It's a proletarian theater, democratic, open, simple, inexpensive, serving life, not uh, the red uh, carpet. And uh, I think we can learn a lot about this theater uh, and about theater in general uh, from, from this remarkable uh, architectural achievement in an existing building, very inappropriate for this function. I mean, who would think of making a theater in this long and narrow space? Well, she did, and she did brilliantly. Uh, and. Uh, I, I, I regret I am not in Brazil to be able to, to watch a, a performance, a theater performance in this um, very democratic, and very open uh, uh, theater in a very unconventional space. You know, it's not a typical theater plan at all. And here it is. It's life, again, from the immediacy of life you create architecture with, uh, you know, the banality of a scaffolding uh, structure, you know, uh, some chairs, but it inspires this space. It's 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 um, it's it's truly inspiring, you know, both to to the actors and and the and the the audience. This is one of the most radical theaters ever built. I mean, look at look at this facade of the theater, you know, with a beautiful tree uh, allowed to be, and then uh, you know the interior uh, breathing life and uh, modest modest cars at the bottom, no uh, scientifically. Uh, conceived uh, parking lot, anything like it. It's it's it, it's life, you know. And it's yes, yes. There are cars. What can we do? We live in uh, in in modernity, and we do have cars. But somehow, if you look at the whole thing, this uh, uh, this theater is clearly saying yes to unpretentious life. You know, the life of a neighborhood in a city. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's not uh, positioned, uh, you know, emphatically. It's a it, it's it's a it's a theater at the periphery, but at the periphery you you rediscover life. Uh, yes, even uh, welcoming uh, ruin uh, graffitis on the walls, it's fine. It's life. It's sincerity, and we need sincerity. And look at this: the interior. You don't even know any longer who is the actor, who who is the audience, who is in the audience. You know, they are all together. And that's how it should be, actually. Hey, look at this. You know, a theater on a corridor. This is architecture at its best, in my opinion. And done with the simplest means. Scaffoldings? Yes, scaffoldings. But they are beautiful in the, you know, simple, transparent uh, uh, attributes as a structure. 
well, some would say, well, you know, this is not really architecture. Of course, it is real architecture with a capital A. In fact, all letters should be capital. And uh, that dog seems to agree with me. I love this building. It gives you hope, really. Theater should be part of, of life, part of the theater of life, part of the street even. And this building evokes something like this. Look, who think, I mean, here, where is the stage actually? You know, the stage is this corridor in a way. And then the plants are part of the, of the ambiance. And then you have all kinds of cables. Uh, you have nature, you have technology, but not an oppressive technology. It's beautiful, life and theater and architecture together. And look at the audience. <laughs> Great. This is great. It's a gentle avant-garde. Let's put it in this way. Yes, a gentle avant-garde. Look at that bike <laughs> hanging there. Yes, and with objects maybe found on the street. Why not? Is it sustainable? Yes, it's highly sustainable. You are going to see also a chapel itself, highly sustainable. Should we build a highly sustainable chapels? Yes, we should. Instead of a pretentious, uh, religious, dogmatic, uh, you know, heavy, like heavy syrup uh, buildings that are built even in our country. And look at the theater by Lina Bobardi. A tree, you know, an old building, allowed to rust, uh, there's some enclosure there with glass, and there is the theater. It's one of the best theaters ever built. That's what I think. Lina Bobardi, this is another interesting work, um, SESC Pompeia, 1982. Uh, look what she did with this, well, the way existing structures in concrete, but look at the, the piercing, uh, the windows, the openings in the concrete walls and uh, the connections, I, I, I imagine, I don't know, but it's possible that she created these, uh, um, you know, uh, bridges between the two, between the two buildings. It's, 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 it's a building which would be considered by some brutalist, but it's a building which has, has a sensitivity which is not brutal or brutalist at all. Look at this window. It's an event, an architectural event in itself. Why did she choose this, this window, no informally designed? It's exquisite. So who says that architecture is not an art are wrong. Of course it is an art. I mean, at its best, it is an art. You need an artistic disposition to be able to do something like this. You say it's just a detail. Yes, it's a detail, but it's a detail which belongs to the soul of the building. And uh, yes, it's a, it's a center for culture, for art, for exhibitions, unafraid of, uh, uh, you know, rough uh, textures or rough materials. It's about the truth of life again. It's not about embellishing things. Good architects very rarely use, uh, you know, uh, finishes, you know, like plaster and hiding the makeup of buildings. We don't need makeup when there is a powerful inner beauty. You don't need makeup. Makeup is for weaker, weaker beings. And look at these buildings. They don't have any makeup. I mean, the only, you know, so-called... Uh, uh, intervention that probably was not there from the beginning is the redness of the of the paint of the of the of the doors, but the the concrete is is allowed to be itself without being uh, hidden behind uh, plaster, and uh, this is the model uh, of the building and uh, look at at it uh, you know uh, alive so to speak.
Now, who could say that this is not a great work? It is a great work. And uh, built more than 40 years ago. I mean, built. He worked, she worked with existing structures. And she just had some interventions there that are, uh, you know, very inspired and inspiring. I mean, what Kazuyo Shejima, Sejima does now with, uh, not just her, I, I just took as an example with, uh, you know, unaligned uh, square windows. Nina Bobardi did this uh, almost half a century earlier. Again, who would say that this is not great architecture? It is. <laughs> uh, very much so. It inflames the heart, the soul. Because it has power, it has raw power, as opposed to uh, Zaha Hadid. And I mentioned uh, in the discussion before I started that there was an exhibition in London uh, showing the work both of Lina Bobarti and uh, Zaha Hadid. And they, they shared the same poster exactly, you know, in half. But as opposed to uh, Zaha Hadid, who uh, claimed at one point that she was looking for a raw R A W, a raw earthy vital architecture, which she actually never arrived at. With all due respect for Zaha Hadid, because her architecture is not raw and is not earthy, Lina Bobardi's architecture is. It is raw and it is earthy. If I look at this picture, what do I see? I see some existing concrete uh, buildings. Uh, it's possible they belong to some industrial uh, uh, function and, and past. But she brought in playfulness because if you look, you know, the windows and the doors, they are all, uh, they all, they are painted with red, the, the redness, which expresses passion and expresses love, but it's also the playfulness of the shapes. Look at the piercing, the, the openings in the, in the concrete wall, massive as it is, but the, 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 the piercings, the openings, are informal and playful and artistic. It's about playfulness. It's about being a child again, so to speak. And that playfulness is very important. And she differentiates between... The, uh, the building on the right and the building on the on, on the left. The theme is the same, uh, you know, windows piercing the the, the concrete uh, massive uh, uh, walls. But on the right they are square, and on the left they are uh, you know uh, organic, so to speak, or uh, you know informal. And this is the plan. It's beautiful. <laughs> Because there is also tension. It's not a placid architectural configuration. Those connections between the two buildings, uh, you know, are, are uh, uh, not neglecting even the labyrinth and the, you know, the visceralization of architecture. And functioning, no? I mean, there is an appreciable audience here. The public of all ages. Why not bring the water inside the building as well? Well, in uh, in Brazil, it's easier than in other parts of the world. But she was in Brazil at that time. And look at this drawing by Lina Bobardi. What architect today would indulge in in this kind of graphic work? Imagine a student in a school of architecture doing this kind of drawing for the atelier in the school. It would be immediately dismissed. Why? Because we forgot to be playful. I mean, look, she introduces in this drawing, I, I don't know if, I, yes, here you see it better. It's beautiful. It's beautiful because it says yes to life. It says yes to insects. It says yes to animals. It says yes to plants. 
it's it's beautiful but with this kind of drawing you would fail the, the admission in most architecture schools because more roses they are and so called important they would not understand you know how could you do something like this so naive so infantile but it's not naive or if it is it, it is in that superior sense in which Buckminster Fuller recommended us to dare to be naive so Lina Bobardi dared to be naive. A chair by her, massive wood. You can trust this chair. <laughs> no doubt it will last more than the Egyptian pyramids. And, and this is how it was made. You know, in a, a sketch, it shows you immediately and you understand it immediately how it came into being. Very simple, out of four parts. One, two, three, four. That's it. Okay, this is the, you know, the largest plan of the building that we just saw. Loisir, no? Uh, culture, no? Uh, uh, conversion or re reconversion. Here is the architect. Uh, and uh, the the raw concrete of, of, of the building as she left it, and it it was uh, again and again. You need artistic uh, uh, disposition. You need uh, the artistic attributes. You need to be an artist as well in order to uh, you know uh, take decisions in this respect, which 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 have to do with aesthetics. But it's not an aestheticism here. In a way, it's the opposite of aestheticism. Doesn't matter where you take pictures of or from, it still looks great. Because the conception of, of what she did here is great. It's, it's resolutely modern, almost provocatively so. Uh, but, but, Another picture with her in uh, in her house and and the window in that uh, uh, in this uh, complex of buildings. Why did she make them like this? Why not? Why does everything have to be explained logically? Why can't we just uh, explain illogically? The Sao Paulo Museum of Art, also by Lina Bobardi. Here it is. Red. The color of passion, the color of love, the color of fire, uh, the color of art, maybe red. No, red, the color of the king. Well, in uh, European alchemy, red um, was uh, described as belonging to the king and white as belonging to the queen. Uh, yes. Uh, a mechanism for displaying art, a large building, but this is not a drawing that belonged to her. It was done by, who knows, a student or someone analyzing a building after, after the building was built. Uh, here you see the very clear, to, to use the word that we talked about, the conceptual, uh, uh, you know, uh, representation of the idea that stood behind the building. Very powerful, these, uh, these uh, vertical structural elements, which she emphasized by making them or, you know, painting them in red. And the redness is also uh, rediscovered or re-employed inside the building, as you can see. The diagonals of, uh, of connecting the two floors and then the vertical uh, uh, structural elements that support this uh, very large building. Not bad. The Sao Paulo Museum of Contemporary Art. And art, although it it inspires itself from nature. Here is situated di dichotomically almost or dialectical vis-a-vis -vis the greenness of nature. So you have the redness of the structure 
from which the whole uh, prism is suspended in contrast to the green the greenness of, of nature and underneath the museum a market beautiful why not Well, this is uh, an event that was organized probably, you know, having nothing to do with Lina Bobardi, but the space underneath is inviting to all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, ephemeral or uh, temporary uh, activities. So in a way, this museum is very generous towards the city because it offers the space underneath it to the city for all kinds of activities. Some of them having nothing to do with, with, with art. And that is art right there in the, with redness, with clarity, with force, with vigor, with, uh, with, uh, with a big yes addressed to, address to life. Inside the big city, yes, Sao Paulo. Lina Bobardi. It takes courage to make something like this, and she did have courage. And look at this. It's very possible that Bernard Chumi was right when he said a good building can be explained to your grandmother in one minute on the phone. This building can also be explained to one's grandmother or grandfather uh, in a minute on the phone. Okay, the, the building is prismatic, but we see at the level of the ground, also the sensualities of curves. Uh, so, you know, in fact, uh, what I see on the ground here is very similar to a um, more recent building by Toyo Ito in Taiwan. And you have a concrete wall and you paint it in red, and that's what you get. And look at again at the drawing by, by this very special architect. Again, what architect would draw something like this? Not many. And I include myself in those, not many. No, no, I include myself in, well, yes, in the, you know, uh, I, 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 I am one of those who, who cannot draw like this, with this uh, daring uh, naivete. Now, these are her words, stones against diamonds. And this I love as well, because I do believe, like her, I assume that stones are more important than diamonds, although the world loves the diamonds. Now we love glittering things, expensive things. The more expensive, the better. But do we know what a stone is in its mystery? That gray, so-called banal stone is a mystery in itself. Like uh, Louis Sullivan used to say, it takes great imagination to understand wood as wood, uh, brick as brick, stone as stone, and so on. And it's true. So these are the words of 
Lina Bobardi, stones against diamonds. And uh, I think the whole world should reflect on, 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 what, on, what, on what she said. Uh, it was a collection of essays with this title. So this collection of essays is the first ever English anthology of her, of, of her writings. It includes texts written when she was still living in Italy, as well as later contributions to a number of Brazilian newspapers, journals, and magazines. An acute critic and a creative thinker, Bobardi, proposes a series of new parameters for design thinking and practice, such as the notions of historical presence, or presence, sorry, roughness, and tolerance to imperfection. All three are beautiful. Presented collectively, her text presents a wealth of inspirational thoughts articulated in a refreshingly simple language. So here we see, let's, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about all three, one by one. The historical present. Well, I mentioned this earlier that what is truly important, if I am to use this word, doesn't pass. It doesn't become history. It becomes a history in the sense that it doesn't die. It doesn't end. It continues. So a significant so-called past doesn't pass. And, and because it doesn't pass, it is present. So that's what she meant probably uh, by these two words, historical present, then roughness. We saw the roughness in the... Uh, in, uh, in, in the works that I already showed, and then tolerance to imperfection. This shows clearly that Lina Bobardi was not a dogmatic, uh, you know, frozen uh, spirit at all. She was open, she was vulnerable. She was accepting the vulnerabilities of life and the vulnerabilities of imperfection and the vulnerabilities of, of the passing time you know, and the, the, the vulnerabilities of what appears to be not finished or not, uh, uh, you know, uh, perfected. A very subtle uh, critic and a very, very subtle creator. A very sensitive. Stones Against Diamonds, Lina Bobardi, Archit Architecture Words. And sketches, drawings of uh, furniture. We saw her sitting in one of the, those chairs, the one on the left uh, left side, the lower left side. Here she is, um, you know, uh, contemplative nature, no doubt. But you have to have a contemplative nature in order to, to, to do something uh, worth doing uh, in the field of art. Now, a, a chapel, I mentioned it earlier, and it's, it's, it's a magnificent chapel, much better than anything uh, Peter Sumter, for example, did. Santa Maria dos Anjos uh, Chapel, look at this. It, it, it's brilliantly simple. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's unassuming, and yet it is a chapel. And you, you, you discover this even more when you contemplate the inside, the interior. And look at this, if you pass by this building, what would you say this is? Somehow in its simplicity, it tells you I am a chapel. But you see, don't see the sign of the cross. You don't see anything of the religious paraphernalia that accompanies so many churches and chapels and, and cathedrals. And look at the plan. It's deceptively simple. It's surrounded by this veranda. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is also a metaphor in a way that it doesn't have a back. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the roundness of, of God in a way. It's everywhere. But then you, see, you have the diagonal uh, uh, direction, the entrance into the building, you enter through the corner in a way, and uh, this becomes kind of a, a deformed uh, hexagon. And then where the altar is supposed to be, you just have a desk and two windows, left and right. Nothing could be simpler than this. 
and nothing could be more effective. And the color, again, con co complementing the color of nature. You have green in nature, you have redness in the building. Because even in green architecture, as we like to call it these days, even green architecture in, it, in its essence is actually red because it's made by men. It's an artificial intervention into, you know, the cosmos of uh, reality uh, and, 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 you know, uh, intrinsically, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is red, even if it's uh, so-called green architecture. It's just that Lina Bobardi was more honest than us. This is another great picture. I mean, really, when, when I look at this picture, I understand immediately what the building is. And you don't need the, you know, the symbols of any religion. This belongs to, to any religion. Because God belongs to all of us. And even if it's not painted in red, even like this, it has dignity. And it has poetry. I love it. I love it. A chapel. Now this is, uh, I don't know what this is and why I placed it there. Here, uh, uh, look at this. This building is telling us to be modest. I mean, how else to situate ourselves in relationship with the divine, then from a from a position of, 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 of modesty. A triumphant church is a nonsensical uh, way of expressing uh, you know the reality of fact. How could a church be triumphant, meaning arrogantly triumphant? It can't. And uh, here she is, uh, I don't know, uh, contributing to with her own hands to something on uh, I don't know where. This reminds me of Maya Lin uh, also uh, contributing uh, personally to something for the uh, Vietnam Memorial. Lina Bobardi's Valeria Cirelli's house, built very few years after Lina's glass house, a very solid house in comparison to the glass. We saw already this uh, house, but here we have different pictures. We saw this picture. And you see the similarity between this building and the chapel I just showed. And in a way, you know, the house of God is not dissimilar from the house of man, because man and God are correlative, as uh, Dostoevsky quite well knew. Uh, so between this building and the chapel that we just saw is a, is a, is a fundamental uh, uh, similarity. And yet, you know, you cannot say that one building copies the other. Casa sul Mare di Sicilia. Uh, this was built in, uh, in actually in, uh, in, in Sicily. This is a building that was, uh, it is by her, but uh, was uh, left, uh, um, you know, unkept, so to speak, and there was a, a quest for uh, donations to restore it. Uh, I don't know what school of architecture, maybe architectural association. But we recognize her uh, freedom in, uh, in in piercing the the walls with these uh, uh, uninhibited, uh, uh, you know, openings. I do, I do think the architecture of Lina Bovardi is an architecture of hope. That with simple means, she's actually saying architecture is important, but more important than architecture is life and nature. You see, Lina Bovardi Fellowship 2016, open call. Somehow her spirit is very much present even when the building is, uh, you know, uh, attacked by, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 vital, vitalistic, uh, um, you know, explosion of natural forms and so on. A chair, uh, we saw her sitting in this chair, 
here she is uh, in older age in her apartment, reflecting, reflecting, thinking, feeling. That's it. Let's wish her happy birthday. A truly great architect. Uh, thank you.